VOA One, the hits Little Nas X with Panini. My name is Nikki Strong. You know, you can reach me on Facebook or Twitter at I A M N I K K I S T R O N G. I am. Welcome to Learning English on the Voice of America. I'm Katie Weaver. Our program is designed for English learners. So we speak slowly using a simple style and limited vocabulary. Today on the show, Alice Bryant brings us Ask a Teacher. We also hear from reporter Susan Shand. And we close the show with an American story. Today we hear Nathaniel Hawthorne's Dr. Heidegger's Experiment. But first, the capital of New Zealand has enjoyed an exciting week since the arrival of a Hollywood filmmaking team. Canadian director James Cameron and his crew will begin filming a second part or sequel to his popular 2009 science fiction movie, Avatar. The project is among a handful of film productions beginning in New Zealand as the nation reopens following its successful COVID-19 containment effort. The government hopes the country's film industry will help repair the economic damage blamed on the health crisis. New Zealand's borders remain closed to foreigners, but the government permitted the 55-member Avatar 2 team to enter. The group arrived on a private airplane. Annabelle Sheehan, head of the New Zealand Film Commission, praised the return of the film business. Certainly, the fact that we are able to start earlier than some countries is great. But she also expressed concern for the many countries that continue to face major difficulties from COVID-19. New Zealand's high mountains, green valleys, and thick forests were made famous by the series of movies The Lord of the Rings. The country has drawn several major film productions in recent years. About 47 productions were in progress when Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, on March 26, ordered a travel ban and other restrictions to stop the spread of the coronavirus. The public health efforts were a success and New Zealand's officials say the virus has been almost eliminated from the country. New Zealand was among the first nations in the world to return to normal this week, apart from the closed border. Avatar producer John Landau posted a picture of himself and director Cameron after landing last week. He also said they would avoid contact with other people for 14 days, as is the government rule for visitors. Landau praised New Zealand's coronavirus campaign on Radio New Zealand. Your country has become a leader in how to deal with something like this, he said, adding, I think films will want to come. With many people around the world stuck at home, pressure is on filmmakers and others to make new material and release it. Movie industry experts, however, say content creators are held back because of the lack of safe places to work. Now, New Zealand appears to be a good possibility for such work. We've had a few international inquiries, and that's on the back of our COVID-free status, said Gary Watkins. He is head of Avalon Studios, based in Wellington. Avalon was used in the making of the 2017 movie, Ghost in the Shell, 
starring Scarlett Johansson. The company is also involved in making the new Avatar movie. Wellington is home to major studios and production centers, including director Peter Jackson's Weta Digital. The studio produced Jackson's The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit movies. But the admission of Cameron and his crew into New Zealand has been criticized. Opposition party leaders have asked why the movie crew was let in with seeming ease, while restrictions on other visitors, including family members of citizens, remain. Many businesses in the country are struggling without employees needed for their operations. Economic Development Minister Phil Twyford defended the decision on the Avatar film crew. He said the border was only open to a few foreigners who were important for projects with substantial economic value. New Zealand's film industry is thought to be valued at more than $1 billion each year. A six-month international film can create an estimated 3,000 jobs. You only need a few international people coming to trigger thousands of jobs, said Film Commission Chief Sheehan. And New Zealand needs the jobs. The government expects joblessness to rise because of the coronavirus. The tourism industry brings in more than $16 billion yearly, representing 6% of the value of all goods and services produced in New Zealand. But in the longer term, the films should help the nation's tourism industry recover. People all over the world will see these new titles and will start seeing New Zealand in a new light. This, Sheehan said, will contribute hugely to tourism. The famous gardens of French painter Claude Monet reopened to the public this week as France lifts its coronavirus restrictions. The gardens are in Giverny, about 70 kilometers outside Paris. They are where Monet created his best-known works, including water lilies. More than 500,000 people visit each year to walk the pathways where Monet set up his easel and painted great works of Impressionist art. Most visitors come in the spring, when the painter's large and colorful gardens are in full bloom. This spring, however, the gardens bloomed only for garden workers. France remains closed to international visitors, so the reopening of the gardens lets French people experience them as few ever have, without crowds. Groups are not permitted, and individuals must keep social distance. The pathways are one way, and everyone must wear face coverings. Jean-Marie Avisar is the head gardener at Monet's Gardens. He has worked there for 32 years. At this time of year, we normally welcome 4,000 to 5,000 people a day, Avisar said. Now we can have 900 persons. He added, we are very happy to show what we do. People will see the garden a bit like on a private visit. 73-year-old Jérôme Blanchet was pleased to see the gardens without the crowds. We are seeing it in exceptional conditions, he said. Another visitor 
Parisian Roberto Velutini agreed. There are not a lot of people. Today is perfect, he said. Claude Monet bought the Giverny farmhouse for his family in 1883. He lived there until his death in 1926. He changed the house into a colorful mansion and filled the grounds around it with every flower that would grow in the local climate, including thousands of roses. He built a Japanese-style water lily garden with a small green bridge. There he painted one great work of art after another. After World War II ended, the house and gardens were left empty. In the 1970s, however, they were restored to look exactly how Monet had built them. The property was opened to the public in the 1980s. Last year, it welcomed 717,271 visitors. Almost 50% were international visitors. I'm Susan Shand. This week's question comes from Vukani of South Sudan. Vukani writes, What is the difference between loose and lose? This morning, I heard some people debating about it. Dear Vukani, It makes sense that people were debating the difference between loose and lose. The two words are commonly mistaken, even by native English speakers. It is probably because the words are close in spelling and pronunciation. In speaking, both words use the vowel sound oo. But lose ends in the z sound, while loose ends in the s sound. In writing, loose has only one more O than lose. They may look and sound alike, but the two words are unrelated. Let's start with lose, which is a verb. Lose has many meanings. Today, I will tell you about three. It can mean to fail to win, such as a game or competition. We lost the tennis game last night. Better luck next week. Notice that the past form is lost, not lost. That is because lose is an irregular verb. Lose can also mean to misplace something or to be unable to find it. People can lose many kinds of things. Here's an example. Oh, no, the airport lost my bags. Now I have nothing to wear to the wedding. Lose can also mean to have less of something as time passes, as in this. Grandma has been losing her eyesight for a few years. These days, I usually help her walk around. A person can also lose sleep, weight, or hair or something non-physical, such as memory, interest, or contact. Now let's talk about the word loose. Loose is an adjective that means not tightly attached or held in place. Many things can be loose, like clothing. Excuse me, these shoes are a little loose. Do you have a smaller size? Lots of other things can be loose, such as nails when they are not securely attached, teeth when they are ready to come out, or wires when they are not tightly connected. Though loose is an adjective, 
It can take verb form. The verb is loosen. To loosen means to make loose, as in this. When he left the meeting, he quickly loosened his tie. In the example, notice that the past form ends in ed. Loosen is a regular verb. And that's Ask a Teacher for this week. I'm Alice Bryant. And now, our American Stories program. Here is Dr. Heidegger's Experiment by Nathaniel Hawthorne. That very unusual man, old Dr. Heidegger, once invited four friends to meet him in his office. There were three white-bearded gentlemen, Mr. Medbourne, Colonel Killigrew, and Mr. Gasquagna. And there was a thin old lady whose husband had died, so she was called the Widow Wykerly. They were all sad old creatures who had been unfortunate in life. As a young man, Mr. Medbourne had lost all his money in a badly planned business deal. Colonel Killigrew had wasted his best years and health enjoying the pleasures of women and drink. Mr. Gasquagna was a ruined politician with an evil past. As for the widow Wykerly, Tradition tells us that she was once a great beauty, but shocking stories about her past had led the people of the town to reject her, so she lived very much alone. It is worth stating that each of these three men were early lovers of the widow Wykerly, and they had once been on the point of killing each other over her. My dear old friends, said Dr. Heidegger, I would like your help in one of my little experiments. He motioned for them to sit down. Dr. Heidegger's office was a very strange place. The dark room was filled with books, cobwebs, and dust. An old mirror hanging between two bookcases was said to show the ghosts of all the doctor's dead patients. On another wall hung a painting of the young woman Dr. Heidegger was to have married long ago. But she died the night before their wedding after drinking one of the doctor's medicines. The most mysterious object in the room was a large book covered in black leather. It was said to be a book of magic. On the summer afternoon of our story, a black table stood in the middle of the room. On it was a beautiful cut glass vase. Four glasses were also on the table. Dr. Heidegger was known for his unusual experiments, but his four guests did not expect anything very interesting. The doctor picked up his black leather book of magic. From its pages, he removed a dried-up old rose. This rose, said the doctor, was given to me 55 years ago by Sylvia Ward, whose painting hangs on this wall. I was to wear it at our wedding. Would you think it possible that this ancient rose could ever bloom again? Nonsense, said the widow Wykerly with a toss of her head. You might as well ask if an old woman's lined face could ever bloom again. See, answered Dr. Heidegger, 
He reached for the vase and threw the dried rose into the water it contained. Soon, a change began to appear. The crushed and dried petals moved and slowly turned from brown to red. And there was the rose of half a century looking as fresh as when Sylvia Ward had first given it to her lover. That is a very pretty trick, said the doctor's friends. What is the secret? Did you ever hear of the Fountain of Youth? asked Dr. Heidegger. The Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon went in search of it centuries ago, but he was not looking in the right place. If I am rightly informed, the famous fountain of youth is in southern Florida. A friend of mine has sent me the water you see in the vase. The doctor filled the four glasses with water from the fountain of youth. The liquid produced little bubbles that rose up to the silvery surface. The old guests agreed to drink the water, although they did not believe in its power. Before you drink, my friends, the doctor said, you should draw up a few general rules as guidance before you pass a second time through the dangers of youth. You have had a lifetime of experience to direct you. Think what a shame it would be if the wisdom of your experiences did not act as a guide and teacher. The doctor's four friends answered him with a laugh. The idea that they would ever repeat the mistakes of their youth was very funny. Drink, then, said the doctor. I am happy that I have so well chosen the subjects of my experiment. They raised the glasses to their lips. If the liquid really was magical, it could not have been given to four human beings who needed it more. They seemed as though they had never known youth or pleasure. They looked like they had always been the weak, unhappy creatures who were bent over the doctor's table. They drank the water. There was an almost immediate improvement among the guests. A cheerful glow like sunshine brightened their faces. They looked at one another, imagining that some magic power had really started to smooth the lines on their faces. Quick, give us more of this wondrous water, they cried. We are younger but we are still too old. Patience, said Dr. Heidegger, who watched the experiment with scientific coolness. You have been a long time growing old. Surely you could wait half an hour to grow young. Again, he filled their glasses. The four guests drank the liquid in one swallow. As the liquid passed down their throats, it seemed to change their whole systems. Their eyes grew clear and bright. Their hair turned from silver to darker shades. My dear widow, you are lovely, cried Colonel Killigrew, who watched as the signs of age disappeared from her face. The widow ran to the mirror. The three men started to behave in such a way that proved the magic of the fountain of youth's water. Mr. Gascoigne's mind turned to political topics. He talked about nationalism and the rights of the people. 
he also told secrets softly to himself. All this time, Colonel Killigrew had been shouting out happy drinking songs while his eyes turned towards the curvy body of the widow Wykerly. Mr. Medbourne was adding dollars and cents to pay for a proposed project. It would supply the East Indies with ice by linking a team of whales to the polar icebergs. As for the widow Wykerly, she stood in front of the mirror, greeting her image as a friend she loved better than anything in the world. My dear old doctor, she cried, please give me another glass. The doctor had already filled the glasses again. It was now near sunset, and the room was darker than ever. But a moonlike light shined from within the vase. The doctor sat in his chair, watching. As the four guests drank their third glass of water, they were silenced by the expression on the doctor's mysterious face. The next moment, the exciting rush of young life shot through their blood. They were now at the happy height of youth. The endless cares, sadness, and diseases of age were remembered only as a troubled dream from which they had awoken. We are young, they cried. The guests were a group of happy youngsters, almost crazy with energy. They laughed at the old-fashioned clothing they wore. They shouted happily and jumped around the room. The widow Wykerly, if such a young lady could be called a widow, ran to the doctor's chair and asked him to dance. Please excuse me, answered the doctor quietly. My dancing days were over long ago. But these three young men would be happy to have such a lovely partner. The men began to argue violently about who would dance with her. They gathered around the widow, each grabbing for her. Yet by a strange trick owing to the darkness of the room... The tall mirror is said to have reflected the forms of three old gray men competing for a faded old woman. As the three fought for the woman's favor, they reached violently for each other's throats. In their struggle, they turned over the table. The vase broke into a thousand pieces, the water of youth flowed in a bright stream across the floor. The guests stood still. A strange coldness was slowly stealing over them all. They looked at Dr. Heidegger, who was holding his treasured rose. The flower was fading and drying up once more. The guests looked at each other and saw their looks changing back. Are we grown old again so soon? they cried. In truth, they had. The water of youth had powers that were only temporary. Yes, friends, you are old again, the doctor said. And the water of youth lies wasted on the ground. But even if it flowed in a river at my door, I still would not drink it. This is the lesson you have taught me. But the doctor's four friends had learned no such lesson. They decided at that moment to travel to Florida and drink morning, noon, and night from the Fountain of Youth. And that's our show. But we'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place, 
with another Learning English program on The Voice of America. Thanks for joining us. I'm Katie Weaver.